recorded live from the secret underground lair of Crimson Cowl Comics and Collectibles, this is the Crimson Cowl Comic Club Podcast. The following issues may contain spoilers. You can take the Slayer powers out of the girl, but you can't something something sharp objects. I'm Anthony. I'm Kirby. And I'm Katie. Welcome to issue number 259 of the Crimson Cowl Comic Club podcast. Each and every week, we meet here to talk about comic books. On this week's show, we are going to have a a club discussion on Buffy the Last Vampire Slayer special number one. It is the follow-up one-shot to last year's uh, four-issue miniseries from Boom Studios that we talked about as a club discussion. So they did a follow-up issue. Uh, We'll talk about that today. Then we're going to jump into our weekly reviews. That's where we go back and forth and talk about the books that we've been reading. They could be new, they could be old, but we're going to talk about them there. So that is going to be the lineup for this week's show. We're going to jump right into it with this special of uh, Buffy, the last vampire slayer. It's been four years and Buffy, Angel, and Thess have been, uh, what's funny, it says Angel, um, because that should say Spike. This was uh, taken right from the previews. So, yeah, that's interesting. I'm going to rewrite it here on the spot. It's been four years, and Buffy, Spike, and Thess have been living in relative peace as a dysfunctionally cozy family, but nothing can last forever. Tara might not be dead, but they're losing hope for her staying among the living, and strange new vampires have been sighted. To get to the bottom of these unfolding horrors, our gang will have to head underground and face the horrifying true cause of the decline in the vampire activity. This comic is done by Casey Gilley, Joe Yarrow, Maria Keen, Leah Caballero, uh, Joanna Lafuente, and Ed Dukeshire. Those names sound familiar, and there's probably a good chance that uh, all, if not most of them, have worked on that uh, four-issue miniseries that we talked about. I'm pretty sure at least the top uh, writers and artists there. But yes, so this is a uh, one-issue special. Uh, The Buffy the Last Vampire Slayer was something that was sort of branching off of like the television continuity, but uh, going into the future in which Buffy is probably in her mid to late 60s, give or take. You know, it's basically 50 years after she was called to be the Slayer. And uh, so this comic lives in a realm where they can pretty much do whatever they want. And the idea of the story was that, uh, you know, the sun was being blocked out and there was a big tragedy with the the Slayers and the Watcher Council and basically uh, leaving uh, Buffy to be, you know, one of the very few people, uh, uh, one of the few survivors out of her uh, quote-unquote Scooby gang. Uh, We did find out that Anya was still around and Spike was still around, uh, but it was a very tight-knit group, and and Buffy was kind of thrust back into this when um, she was basically uh, running into uh, Thessaly, which I believe is the full name. They call her Thessalot in the story here. And um, which we uh, had found out that was the daughter of uh, Willow and Tara. And that's where, you know, it takes some of the, the branching off of the TV show into its own own kind of realm because of the events, what happened with those characters in there. And uh, yeah, and we saw them basically just kind of battling the vampires and trying to, you know, take back the night, if you will, and bring back the sun and finding out that uh She's, you know, the daughter here, uh, Thess is the chosen one and sort of has these uh, Slayer and Witch, you know, combo powers and and uh, all of that, you know, prophecy behind her. And so this issue here, what we're talking about, uh, jumps it into uh, four years in the future from the from that miniseries. I just kind of recapped. And we kind of see where our characters are left. Uh, we're kind of, it's almost like a, uh, a whole reset of the Slayer line and the fact that, uh, you know, Buffy is the watcher to Thess as Giles once was to Buffy. Uh, we've got Spike in there. We do get a little cameo from Anya, which is fun to see. Um, but this whole issue kind of focuses on the idea of Thess 
coming into her own of this new role in her life and uh, all the responsibility it has to take. You know, we had seen the dwindling powers of Buffy over the years of these stories, and she is, you know, strictly kind of left to the watcher status and kind of thrust into this, uh, you know, this parenting role that she didn't quite ask for, and she very much tried to refuse from that first miniseries, but now she's, you know, she's all that's kind of left with her and Spike and, you know, their romance, and and uh, we see Thess with a little romance going on in here, and as the synopsis mentioned, is that we have um, one other little uh, plot thread that is kind of being picked up on where we didn't really have too much detail on what had happened with uh, Tara in the initial version of the of this uh, alternate timeline. And this comic is dealing with that directly on on uh, basically where is Tara, where is Thessa's mother and and uh, yeah, so that's kind of the overview of what's happening in this first issue. So what we're going to do here, rather than going page by page, panel by panel, kind of talk about, you know, the overall ideas and thoughts, likes and dislikes and things like that. Um, I will throw it over to Kirby first, if you want to uh, jump in and tell us your thoughts on Buffy the Last of Vampire Slayer special number one. I really like this one. This is probably my favorite one so far of the newer Buffy, the older Buffy version. Uh, I like with Spike and Thessaly's little collaboration going on. And of course, her, I can, I like her being the Slayer and the Witch and dealing with her powers. Unlike if you've heard me talk about the other ones with Willow, I just don't care for that version. But this one I really liked. And uh, I kind of expected, ha well, as I was going through the story, when her little friend sat there and drew this mural, I thought for sure we'd see that once Thessaly and the gang left town that her friend would end up kidnapped by someone because of Thessaly. But we find out otherwise later on what's going on with the creature in the cave. But yeah, this was just a ton of fun i really enjoyed reading this one and uh i like how the characters that we've seen pop up how they came to and stuff and just i think this one was really well done yeah when we had talked about that original mini series um you know it, it was it was cool like how you know it was very condensed it could have been much longer it could have been a 12 issue series and i'm sure most of us would have kept reading it but thought you know it was interesting that they would take something with such a huge time jump leave a lot of that mystery to you know up in the air and just kind of focus on this one moment and I think we even said that you know there's a good chance that we would jump back in you know it'd be fun to see if they you know covered some of those lost years or things like that and then about a year later in our time we jump for four years ahead in their time and kind of get this follow-up story and I didn't really know what it was going to be. I didn't read the synopsis, you know, in detail and knowing that I was getting it anyways. And it was a one shot. But yeah, I think they did a good job of just kind of jumping back into these characters and continuing the story going forward as a standalone one. If people weren't unaware of the of the four issue mini, you know, there, there's probably going to be a lot of confusing. You know, they still had some of those moments in that mini series, but it was only done in the sense of, you know, the kind of story they were setting it in. This one since it is picking up right where the other one left off, you know, as far as the status quo of these characters. Um, yeah, if anyone is a Buffy fan that it hasn't read those and they just kind of saw this on the shelf or something, you know, there, you know, there's definitely going to be uh, a couple lost uh, threads here, but I think hopefully, you know, if they dig it enough that they would go back and find that trade paperback. But I thought they did a good job of just keeping the story forward and then, Dealing with all the Tara stuff, um, Tara is a character that hasn't been used uh, much uh, beyond the TV show, I think, in a very, um, you know, for, for pur purposeful reasons. Um, you know, I'm still trying to, like, keep, you know, spoilers from a TV show, something that happened in, like, 2001. <laughs> but uh, that's just how I am when it comes to something like Buffy. And uh, but even all, like, the comics and things like that, like, they're they're hasn't been many takes on reinventions of that character and kind of telling what happened to the character after the show and 
And so this is one of the sto- few stories that actually dove in and did something, you know, pretty, mm-hmm. pretty bold. And yeah, I thought it was pretty interesting and it was pretty cool. And I didn't, you know, know quite what to expect. And uh, much like the last one, it's just like, all right, well, let's give us some more, you know, let's see more of this and fill in these gaps even more go forward. I, I think I'm on board for this whole, you know, future line that they've set up. So, yeah. Yeah, and to your point that if you haven't watched a lot of Buffy or read the other books, like I have watched precisely zero episodes of Buffy, uh, as an outsider to the fandom, you can still follow this very well. I found it quite easy to follow. My background is the six issues we read last year. Uh, So yeah, I think don't worry about it. If you haven't watched the show in a while, you can enjoy this book just for what it is anyway. I I really liked it a lot. It was a lot of fun. I especially enjoyed the scenes of them being a family. I like seeing Thessaly and her school friends and her girlfriends and just how she's developing and growing. Uh, especially, I like that they're giving her more training because, um, you know, she was very super powered at the end of the last series. And, you know, it made sense. They're going out of the bang for the finale. So it's good to see that uh, be developed more um, and just make it feel a little more grounded. I really liked the scene where they're like trying to lasso and then stab the pumpkins. That was super funny. Uh, and yeah, her, her relationship seems really genuine and I want them to succeed because it was cute. And uh, Anya continues to be like a character that I just think is kind of funny. Like she shows up, she's like, oh, do you like my new hair? Like, you know, it's, I got a short haircut. <laughs> So that was kind of funny. Um, I don't know a lot about that character, but I remember like in the last series, she was like the only one to kind of stand up to Buffy because Buffy's like, oh man, my life is horrible. The world is ending, blah, blah, blah. And Anya's like, girl, get a grip. Like the sun exploded or the sun went out. I don't think they told us what happened to it, but there was no sunlight. Like you are not the only person who's suffering here. Um, Also, speaking of Buffy's character growth, I really like she goes from being like, really reluctant not wanting to be a part of anything at all to going from okay well you know my dead friend's kid shows up so I guess I'll take care of them because you know I can't leave them to their lonesome to being like that's my kid keep your hands off her loved it loved seeing that progression and it felt very natural and I'm glad we had this book to expand upon that um I was pleasantly surprised by the first series we read it was a lot of fun so I was really happy to see them revisit this and I hope they do some more so yeah yeah and to branch off when you're just you know curious about Anya and talking about her you know beautifully portrayed by Emma Caulfield in the tv show and she's one of those characters and this happens a lot in Buffy where you have um, a character show up for what is meant to be one episode and then they're really well liked and then they bring them back by the end of the season for another episode and then the next time you see the brand new season they're part of the credits and they're part of the normal cast now uh spike spike is one of those characters that was only meant to be in just like the one episode and then they kept bringing him back every season and then by you know later in the seasons he would be a regular cast member just because just like Mm -hmm. well everybody loves this character anya is the other one because she is this character in the buffy universe where she is this uh, vengeance demon in her day uh that's kind of now trapped in in this mortal body and on the on the television show it's so hilarious because she she is very uh, she's very much like sheldon on the big bang theory where uh okay. she does everything that's you know she has no filter she says everything very earnestly and honestly not knowing that it's not okay to say some things the way she addresses it yeah and you see a little bit of that attitude you know brought through this series but that character throughout the show just continues to impress and it felt it felt almost right that a character who was never like on best friend terms with Buffy in the TV show. I like the fact that she is mm-hmm. one of the last standing people here thrown in just to, cause it's such a different character than Buffy. So that's really cool. That detail actually explains a lot. I just thought she was a smart ass because that was her character. But if you are a demon, like a full blooded demon in a human's body, that would make sense because like, you know, Buffy is the slayer. She's special. She's the chosen one. So like, who's going to, you know, mouth off to her. But if you're a demon, you're like, I'm just as powerful as you. Like, you can't tell me what to do. That's awesome. That is such a cool detail. Nice. Thank you. Yeah. And every, 
every time I think about Anya without, once again, without giving details, one of the most powerful emotional episodes in the entire series where everything it's, it's very purposely depressing and down and, and the mood is just, just, you know, tearing at your heart the whole time. And she's Aww. the one character that is experiencing uh, a close death, a close human death for the first time. And she oh. doesn't quite understand oh, no. why, why, why no. everyone's reacting and, and why this person, it's almost as if she's like a five-year-old in that scenario, even though she's probably sure. thousands of years old in the, in the actual continuity of things. And so she jo always brings so many layers to that character. And yeah, so that just kind of, yeah, carries on. Oh, wow. She's awesome, basically. So Cool. Cool, cool. Um, yeah, any other thoughts uh, from anybody here yet? My favorite scene is still the thrift store when they're going through <laughs> and decide which weapons to grab. They're grabbing shoes. They're looking at <laughs> any lawnmowers darning needles <laughs> buffy find, finds a bag full of swords it's <laughs> yeah it was it was fun i like yeah. the scene where buffy's trying to wake her up and she's like you've been sleeping for 17 hours and we're getting on a plane in like four four hours that was funny is so relatable yeah and also i'm like well you could have just slept on the plane <laughs> yep yeah they, they've done this creative team's done a good job of um uh, you know, capturing the voices from the show and the tone and the mood and obviously with what Katie has said with not having any of that, you know, history to go off of that, it, you know, is kind of thrown into that and it shows that it services fans both new and old mm -hmm. and, um, and just because it was mentioned, uh, uh, I'll, yeah, just talking about some of the humor, I wanted to mention a line here, probably my favorite line is when uh, Buffy and Spike are going through, uh, someone had mentioned the pumpkins, and uh, yeah. there's a line when Buffy and Spike are in the, the pumpkin patch, you know, and going through and picking them out, and uh, she's a little surprised that, uh, she's like, oh, I thought you didn't celebrate Halloween, and Spike mm -hmm. goes, I don't, absolute amateur night, but pumpkins <laughs> are nice round boys who make a porch look festive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know, just hearing james marsters say that in that accent i could it, i don't know it's just hilarious because the you would never expect you know a character like that to, mm -hmm. you know anytime he says kind of something off book like that and it's so well done he's right though they they do make your porch look really festive <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah but yeah um based on what we said here there's still a lot that uh to discover for yourself if you haven't read it um because there's definitely basically the third act of this we uh didn't really touch too much detail on which i think is good for a one shot here and for anyone that is curious and anyone who had missed the previous series but uh yeah it's good stuff and i overall as a buffy fan from the beginning uh, by the way wearing my first uh, piece of buffy merchandise that Ooh. um snugly fits it still fits um it's you know it's, it's a little snug then when i wore it uh, the first time uh back in the 90s but um mm -hmm uh the the evolution of Buffy and I like the fact that once the show had ended it quickly jumped back into a new line of comic books and did that for years and then switched publishers into a brand new restart of comic books and doing a lot of new things twists and turns and doing random one shots and anniversary one shots and doing future tales like this I like that I live in a world where almost like Spider-Man where there's just, and Batman where you can just like pick up so many different Buffy things that are happening at once right now. And yeah, it could be confusing if you're reading all of them and trying to figure out, wait, is this one, this one, or does that tie into that? But I just like the idea that there's just a lot of Buffy that's still happening rather than the show being buried. And then, and then it just only exists as that. So I love the idea that people who are most likely fans of this, um of the television show and everything are getting to continue the lore and uh tell their version so cool cool all right well that is going to do it uh if boom is listening we're hoping that uh creative team returns for more of this line of uh, buffy the last of vampire slayer because it is very good stuff and i do want to do a shout out to issue or cover mm -hmm. b uh let me see here this one i uh maybe ario 
Amandito. That one might be it. I'll just say all the variant cover artists to cover them. Then there's Justine Florentino and uh, Rico Murakami. Um, I just want to say that there's a lot of uh, Michelle Pfeiffer energy coming from this uh, mm -hmm. older Buffy, and I am here for yeah. it. I mean, maybe it's just coincidental after seeing, you know, the recent Ant-Man and the Wasp movies and stuff, but uh, I I'm digging this here. So it's an awesome cover. So. All right. Well, that is going to do it then for Buffy the Last of Vampire Slayer special issue number one. We will have uh, future club discussions. Uh, by the way, at the recording of this episode, Berserker number 12 has been released. So, Yay. yes, very exciting. It's been a long journey here and uh, we've all uh, been pretty excited about it. Um, I'm going to make sure that everybody who has been reading it uh, will be available when we eventually talk about it, uh, having it be, you know, what we assume is the last issue until maybe a new volume and whatever direction. But as far as our club discussion, that issue is coming up here. So uh, once we get everybody together, we will talk about Berserker number 12. Uh, once we have Eric back, we'll talk about the Punisher number 10, which I think is scheduled to release next week. Um, it's Jeff number one, the one shot that should be coming out uh, probably in April, I assume. And then future issues of Once Upon a Time at the End of the World. So those are some of the club discussions that we have coming up in future episodes of this podcast. But that is going to do it for this segment. We're going to jump over to the weekly reviews. All right, safety save. And for all those YouTube people that are watching, once again, seeing the behind the scenes inner workings, I will let you know that the uh, iTunes and Podomatic uh, syncing is back on board. So I've been catching up on the downloads for the audio version. Uh, but if you're watching, the, the only way you're hearing this right now is because you're watching the YouTube video. So thank you for watching. Hopefully you're subscribing and liking the YouTube versions there. Um, but the uh, audio versions are catching up and are going to be back in order so we can uh, have everything releasing in the same time again. But thanks to YouTube uh, and thanks to Kirby's uh, account shared with uh, Under the Color of MS, we've been able to... Uh, Get the YouTube videos out there so that we aren't missing that. All right, we are recording so I can get the uh, weekly reviews going for the audio version. All right, here we go, everybody. Welcome to the weekly reviews. The first on my list is a graphic novel and it is called Bonding. Hmm. Wear your love on your chest. Very coincidental that I'm wearing a picture of Sarah Michelle Geller uh, as I say that, but this has nothing to do with Buffy. A man, a woman, and their parasites. Marcus has been alone since the loss of his closest friend and has just recently entered into the dating scene, while Laura has drifted in and out of relationships since high school. They meet, they have a great first date, and then Marcus almost dies because the slug-like parasite that everybody uh, carries in this world nearly rejects him its host. Bonding is a funny, quirky, and honest look at love in a world where everyone wears their anxiety, not on their sleeves, but on their chest, like big old leeches. This graphic novel is done by Matthew Ehrman, Emily Pearson, Kaylee Davis, and Anne World's Justin Birch. All right, this is something the cover definitely drew my attention in the previews catalog. Uh, Bonding, I'm not too familiar with the uh, creators, but doing a slight research, I think I have read some stuff from uh, some of these creators here. Uh, but yeah, this is a standalone graphic, uh, original graphic novel. Um, what's really cool about this is that um, it starts off and just plops you into this world where these wars have already happened, these aliens have invaded, and everyone's just continuing to live life um, based on what had happened. But you don't deal with a lot, you get a little bit of flashback here and there, but essentially it just moves forward and you're just kind of thrust into this world where these characters are simply just um, on the opening page, they're uh, walking to a restaurant, they're on a first date, and they have some dialogue that's a little confusing if you, uh, you know, just kind of jump in blind to this. You might be wondering, you know, why they're wearing these uh, weird little ties on their shirts until you find out that they are a literal parasite 
slugs that basically are now everyone is, has to wear them and it's it's part of being controlled by these aliens that are uh, had taken over and when you come to a certain age uh basically you you're you're going to almost like a doctor to the point being like well you're old enough now you know kid you got to get your slug you got to get your slug on your chest now and we do see a little moment of flashback and some uh prequels uh back matter uh in how that goes and you know how kids react to you know picking out their slug that they have to wear and and why they have to wear and things that they can't say in public and you know parents trying to say like oh you never say that because if you say that you know something's going to happen it's going to be dangerous because of these alien overlords that have come down but what's crazy about that is that this whole story none of it's really about any of that alien race and the wars it's literally just about these relationships and the people living in that now the their their status quo the new world the the new normal um and i kind of appreciated that you get a couple random um you know imageries of these you know crazy slugs i'll show this one here um got these flo floating little uh like drones and then you got these giant uh slugs here but like none of the story is really concentrating on it, it it's concentrating on the human emotion and how they react to this life and um and what could happen if they reject these slugs and and how it affects their relationships and their overall you know you know depression related to it now there's probably going to be a lot of uh I assume this is a freshly published book, but uh, there's definitely a lot of, um, trying to think of the right word, uh, um, comparisons to, uh, I don't know, maybe something that, you know, the world has gone through over the last couple of years and is still going <laughs> through. You know, there, there's a lot of those vibes in there, but they've kind of swapped it out with a slug that everyone wears. But but the the outcome of it is what, is this story focuses on and what was really interesting without i'm not going to talk about the second half of this book i will talk about that there are lots of different parts you know little chapters and things like that but once you get about halfway through i just want to get to the the page here um the book takes a turn and it uh it goes into what is uh well, I don't even know where the page is. It basically just says book two. And suddenly yeah. it's not just a, it's almost like it could be its own graphic novel. And you're just kind of everything that just happened. You're now kind of following a bunch of different people that uh, have some sort of relation to our first uh, two main characters. So it was kind of mm -hmm. a, a real wild ride to, to get into this and then immediately uh, go a different direction with it, but continue to follow different people's experiences uh, but yeah this this was something uh if you're into like alien invasion stuff you know you're not going to get a lot of uh war and action and too much lore and the science and the science fiction of it all like this is true and true uh, a romance that is just kind of um in that genre but um yeah it, it was quite a surprise i thought it was great read it in a sitting uh excellent work from everybody over at uh, vault for this book but that is my review i think it's available in both trade paperback and hardcover but i got myself the hardcover on that one and uh yeah that is bonding a love story about people and their parasites all right kirby there's another love story that's kind of like that too that's out nowadays that i've been reviewing a lot of and that's called flesh eating cheerleaders from outer space <laughs> they have interesting little slug characters too <laughs> you can show more pages of this book than you can yeah. the other one now. yeah a lot more <laughs> like the whole book uh i checked out silver sable and the wild pack number one okay uh script by gregory wright Art by Stephen Butler and James Sanders III, Silver Sable, Spider-Man, and Sandman's crew take on Hydra when Hydra takes Anna, Silver Sable's niece, captive at her private school. This is fun. I was expe expecting a Black Widow-style character, 
which she is. She's a badass little mercenary. She kind of runs the whole crew of crew of characters that they're trying to build their their own little uh, gang of people that are gonna go around and deal with the baddies. And uh, it's fun watching her in this one because she's going through the training aspects with the characters and uh i don't really know who some of these side characters are they're just basically mercenaries they're trying to join up with the crew but then we get a a moment where she's like yelling at the sandman because he's trying to hide in plain sight in the wilderness as a pile of sand in the middle of nowhere <laughs> just thinking he's gonna trick her as she's testing everybody's powers out and seeing how well they do in combat but yeah she's she's got some pretty wild powers i like the way she works she reminds me a lot of the black widow style character but uh she goes in to, she finds out while well, she's like strict on her rules of who she's gonna save and stuff it's like i'm not just gonna save people for glory and for uh like fame and all that she wants money for what she does and so she's passing up job after job after job and then she finds out about her niece anna being taken prisoner at the school and the school being overrun by hydra and she says she's not going to do it because there's no money involved but then she takes one of the ships and goes off on her own to deal with it. And then the Sandman's like, well, I got humiliated during the training thing. I'm going to go and help her out and prove to her that I'm worthy to help her out. And the other characters join along and they, they follow up. And of course, <laughs> after helping her out and stuff, they get punished for that too. And <laughs> are going to get docked a bunch of pay over the next couple months and stuff. But, but yeah, this was fun. She's comedic. She's, highly actionable i just i really like this character i want to see where it goes i do have about a half a dozen other issues but they it's like number 13 on so i got got to get some fill in there before i'll read those but it was fun and seeing spidey jumping in there it's like at first i thought he was going to be his own thing but it almost feels like you know issue or two he might become part of the crew so i will have to see what happens with that but yeah this is back from the 90s so a lot of fun silver sable and the wild wild pack i keep wanting to say the wild bunch <laughs> <laughs> but yeah from marvel comics now if you ever want to talk more of silver sable um club member eric is a fan of silver sable so that would make complete sense yep she's got <laughs> that type of character to her cool. cool 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 all right let's jump over to katie what you got for us Okay, my first pick today is called Pirate Queen. This is number three. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the other books in this series. It is published by Bad Idea Comics Corp, written by Peter Milligan, Adam Polinas doing the art and cover, Tamara Bonvillains doing the color art, and Simon Boland is doing the letters. Uh, there's also a backup story in here written by Matt Kent. Um, all right, so this is obviously about pirates. I grabbed this uh, last time I was in California, and I I bought it like just in the title alone. I've talked about it before. I love pirates. I think they are very cool topic for a comic book, um, and it starts kind of in the middle. And our main character is a, a female pirate captain whose name is Monday, um, and we find out that she is pregnant. Uh, she is with child and she, uh, her husband uh, was, was killed by the British crown and she is hunting down the uh, dignitary that she feels is responsible because it turns out he's not a good person. He is quite the rogue and not in a charming way. Um, so we see, uh, you know, her and her crew, they have picked up a new crew member who happens to be a black lady who is an escaped slave which is true actually in real history many pirates 
um, were uh, either freedmen or were people who had been enslaved and then ran away and, um, you know, were making a life for themselves. And a couple of her crew members are getting mouthy about it, calls the lady a bad name, and Monday pulls a gun on him and is like, hey, you watch your mouth, like, on this ship, like, we are all here, like, because we value, like, liberty and freedom and, like, living life on our own terms. And if, you know, you aren't willing to abide by that, you know, we will swiftly execute justice, uh, which is also another cool pirate fact. So while, yes, the marauding and the drinking and, you know, the hunting for treasure is true, there is an element of that. There also, on many pirate ships, was uh, an element of order and maybe not quite democracy as we know it, but certainly more fair than you know, the captain always has the final say, of course, but a lot of ships adopted rules of order where like, okay, everyone gets an equal share. If you work, you eat. And if you don't, then, you know, you will be punished and everyone gets a vote. The quartermaster gets two votes and the captain gets the tiebreaker. Um, the, the pirate code of conduct is actually pretty cool. And it's not to say that every ship followed that, but a good many of them did. Uh, a lot of pirates, in addition to, you know, I was talking of them being freedmen, were also former sailors. Like they were employed uh, by the Crown, by the French or the British. The war stopped because, you know, that's just how wars are. And now they're like, well, now what do I do? You know? And they're like, hey, I have this, I have this ship, I have a crew. Like, I don't actually have to go back back home if I don't want to. And they, um, you know, started started living life on the high seas but still kept that sense of order um it's very cool i will drop the wikipedia link later um so we see some of that and then we see the bad guys uh which are represented by the british crown um and the uh, what is the main guy's name mm, bear with me a second so so the bad guy's name is sir cloudesley um he has he is basically haunted by visions of, you know, he keeps dreaming about Monday and she's coming to him as a witch and as a ghost and being like, I'm going to get you for what you did. Uh, we see him execute uh, very brutally a pirate crew that they've captured uh, where he finds out that Monday is still alive and she's coming for him. Um, and then we see Monday and her crew take down a Spanish galleon uh, named after uh, the Torquemada where they have uh, plundered Aztec and Central American gold. And they're talking about, oh, this gold is cursed because uh, the, the Spanish, like when they landed, they killed a whole bunch of the natives and they put a curse on them. Um, and they free a prisoner from that ship who we find out the Spanish have been torturing, um, even though he's connected to the head of the Inquisition at the time, which is, I have to check the timeline if those two events historically would lined up, but for the purpose of this book, there are remnants of the Spanish Inquisition and pirates at the same time. Um, so they free him and there's a nice battle where they make off the ship with a bunch of stolen booty and uh, the ship goes up in flames and they are dividing the gold and the treasure all amongst themselves. And um. Then we have kind of a little denouement where Monday gets wind of the plantation that Sir Claudesley is staying at and they go and raid it and take out some bad guys. And our story uh, kind of ends on a cliffhanger as to what's gonna happen now because Monday is having labor pains and looks like she's gonna have her baby. Um, so it does seem like the story maybe takes place over several months because she never looks extremely pregnant throughout most of this book and then all of a sudden she's squeezing out a baby but uh you know it's it's fiction it doesn't really matter that much but i assumed it took place over some time anyway uh pros uh love books about pirates again i think they're excellent material for comics uh, i like that we have a female pirate as the lead which while it was rare there are examples of um you know, female pirate captains. And it's not as rare as you might think. Um, pretty cool stuff. And let's see what else I like about this. The color work is excellent. So Tamara Bonvillane, when I have seen their work, I found it to be pretty good. Uh, I like their work on the colors. Um, Peter Milligan, everything I've read by him is so good. Uh, the 
probably the examples that I know the most are the uh, Britannia books over at Valiant. Grab those trades, they are excellent. So he did a great job telling me the story. Cons, so I don't know so much that it's a con, but I think it's a bit of an odd business choice in the year 2023. Bad Idea Comics does not appear to have an online storefront. They don't have much in the way of social media. They have a literally one web page that basically lists all the stores you can buy this at. So they seem like they are really supporting local comic book shops. And I love that 110%. That's a thumbs up if you can't see from my jacket. I love it. Um, but I do think you can support local comic shops while exploring online sales. Obviously, I don't live in California, so I can't just run down and grab these other issues. And I would really like to, both because this is a great story and I want to support the creators. Um, so that's just something that I thought was a little different. And, you know, the fact that they don't have a big online footprint was strange to me. Um, but, you know, you, you, you got to do things your own way. I totally understand that comic book artists are their own breed. Um, I don't have any really strong cons about this book other than that, man, I wish I could read the rest of it. Um, but anyway, that's my review of Pirate Queen from Bad Idea Comics. Check it out at your local comic book store. Yeah, to piggyback off of that Bad Idea, um, yeah, I've never seen a Bad Idea book. I've heard about them, but very little, mm -hmm. and just basically everything that you said there, and anytime I came across promotion, whether it's through a podcast or something, it was just always like, I have no idea what the mission statement is and how to get the books and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, yeah, so I could see that being a little frustrating, like you said, in 2023, but uh, mm -hmm. but yeah, like you said, it's an interesting little thing, and they're going with it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. And if Bad Idea wants to promote on this podcast, then uh, let us know. Uh, then we'll be big. Yeah, down. by all means, come on down. All right, uh, let's see here. Uh, my next book here, something I'm very excited about. I dug the 17 or 18 issue run that uh, came before it, but I am talking about Adventures of Superman, John Kent, number one. Another Superman has fallen. Across the multiverse, Kal-El's are being murdered. Val Zod, the Superman of Earth 2, believes only one man can help stop the killing, and that's Kal-El's son, John Kent. John will have to step across dimensions and face the killer of the Kal-El's, the monstrous Ultraman, the man who kidnapped and tortured him for years. And Val Zod is not acting alone in trying to save the Superman. Who is this mysterious woman alongside him? And what is her shocking connection to the Super Family? This comic is done by Tom Taylor, Clayton Henry, Jordi Belair, and Wes Abbott. I believe this is a six-issue miniseries um, launching out of the uh, very successful run that, I, like I said, I think I want 17 or 18 issues. Um, the idea of this version of John Kent in that last series was that uh, John Kent was, you know, a boy. He had went out on adventures uh, to other planets and galaxies. And when he came back, he had aged uh, basically th through and past his childhood and now he's you know like a young adult and he was thrust into this situation um where clark had recently you know revealed that he is superman and all the identity stuff was very public and john is basically kind of forced to live that life as well uh with trying to go to college that first issue of that series which i did talk about uh i've talked about that uh, every you know arc or so um and uh, John tried going to college and within three minutes of having a secret identity, um, he basically saw someone in danger and just, you know, saved the day. And then they're all like, oh, hey, you're Superman's son. Uh, and while Clark Superman had went off on to a long journey in a bunch of books that I didn't read, but didn't need to because they basically sent him off onto a mission and left John Kent as Earth's Superman. And throughout that first series, uh, that is one of the best Superman books I have read because it really does get down to the heart of it. John Kent uh, just does everything he can to help everybody and you know puts himself in danger and is helping the little people, things like that. And throughout that series had developed a, a relationship uh, with this guy, Jay, and throughout them having kind of their 
you know, them figuring out what the relationship was, uh, trying to break that to the parents, while also dealing with the public identity of him being Superman and people thinking that, you know, he's not our Superman, uh, but him still coming through and saving those people regardless of uh, what they think of him. And it, and it was quite an awesome run of a series. And that series, without going into detail, because it's you know a couple months that the issue had come out, but it was kind of uh, bookended with the fact that uh, Clark Kent Superman has returned. And while John had spent this whole time uh, kind of, you know, being in his place and filling, you know, his shoes, uh, he then had to, you know, tell him the other things that were going on in his life with his relationships and things like that. And there's just like, there's like two or three issues in that arc at the end there. They're just so heartwarming and accepting and just awesome. And it's just pure Superman energy all the way through that book. Excellent, excellent read if you haven't read it. Now, that's a lot of talk about a book that, um, you know, I'm not here to talk about because this is the brand new one, which kind of launches right into the fact that uh, into a whole new danger. It's dealing with this dawn of DC that I'm not that familiar with because I'm not reading a lot of uh, the big event books over at DC at the moment. But essentially what this book is dealing with is the fact that uh, the sky is falling and Jonathan Kent um, basically now is in the position where I, I think it happened in the main Superman or action comics where the identity is back to being wiped mm -hmm. again for Superman. Um, I didn't read those stories, but now everything, you know, that's how it happens in comics. Big reveal thing happens for a couple of years and then it just gets mm -hmm. reset and they, you know, someone else tells their story and they continue on with it. But it is him. What the interesting thread is that while John may have his identity back, his secret identity back, uh, his boyfriend Jay doesn't because Jay has a very public oh. persona. So now he has to hide the fact that if he's walking around with John Kent, the world knows him as the boyfriend of Superman, but the world doesn't know him as, you know, maybe a friend of Jonathan Kent. So there now it's kind of turned to the other side where this, uh, this uh, guy Jay has to basically deal with, uh, with having to protect her secret identity, not only of himself, but now his boyfriend as well. But while all this stuff is happening, the sky is falling, uh, a bunch of crazy stuff is happening. We've got uh, multiple supermen showing up. It's just a very action-packed issue, um, just to show off some of the some of the art going on. There's a moment of uh, crazy powers that are happening about halfway through the book. Um, but the interesting ha thing happens, and it's in the... Uh, synopsis here but our earth 2 superman shows up to help save the day and earth 2 superman and john kent uh they show a perfect moment of i i, I just have to read this because it is so great here um they're kind of john or uh the earth 2 superman is kind of shocked of how quick jonathan kent was accepting of like mm -hmm. all right you just helped save someone, but now we're just going to go fly off and talk rather than, and this is where the commentary comes in here. Uh, Earth 2 Superman goes, thank you for talking to me. Instead of jumping to conclusions and lashing out, Jonathan goes, I'm not really a lashing out without, provi uh, uh, provi uh, hold on, Pro uh, provocation? Yep. Provocation? Correct. Yep. Uh, I'm not that kind of person. I've always found those, quote unquote, heroes fighting heroes over a mistaken identity or a mistaken motivation fights a little embarrassing. It reflects kind of poorly on all of us. And it's just kind of a cool moment there where you just see two of these supermen who had just met, not really knowing anything about each other. But hey, we are people that are flying around and we see each other helping people. So they probably have a common goal right there. And that kind of jumps into... Uh, bringing it down to Lois Lane and going to the Kent farm and kind of talking about this thing that's happening in this with all these supermen that are basically being killed off in the multiverse. Now the synopsis um, uh, teased it, so I'm not going to uh, go into it, but there is another character with Earth 2 Superman. It's a very recognizable character as far as the costume goes. You see a slightly different design um but knowing it's a different earth you're like okay this is so and so from another uh from another earth but the identity of this so and so 
is uh, is what the big reveal, and it's the it's the last page thing that makes you want to get issue two right away. And it was really like a, even though it's a six issue mini, I was going to get it anyways. But that new element thrown in that's hanging out with that Earth Two Superman is a pretty cool concept that uh, it got me really excited for uh, what's to come in the the rest of this mini. So yeah, this is the dawn of DC. They're forging the future, one hero at a time. They got a bunch of other comics going on throughout their uh, stories, but this is the only one that um, I'm following because uh, the Harley and Poison Ivy books have been kind of separate from this dawn of DC stuff. But high praise that is overall praise for Jonathan Kent as Superman over the last, you know, three or so years of these stories. So great stuff. Check it out. All right, Kirby. I checked out Quintara Stolen, number one, two, and three from Keen Spot. Written by Casey Boker, art by Ray Griffin, cover, well, cover by lots of people. When Quintara Stone drank from the Holy Grail, little did she know that immortality would be the least of her problems. Jumping between her past and her present and set in a world filled with monsters, demons, enhanced beings, and legends that become truths. Quintara has her hands full protecting humanity from the unknown things hiding in the shadows. I uh, didn't know nothing about this series. I found out that Troy Dungara did a cover for number three. So I'm like, I'm gonna pick that up. And all of a sudden number one and two became available. And I think through DCBS again, they like to put past issues on when new stuff comes out. So that was the first time I ever seen the number one or two even available. And this, the cover for number one just reminded me of Warrior Nun. And the character itself yeah. has that Warrior Nun feel to it because they do deal with the religious characters being the warriors against the demons and stuff. So I just really had that feel from it. But she has, I believe, a little more power. And the warrior non character, well, she is immortal, also. But yeah, she gets to deal with all kinds of demons along the way, different type of entities while she's getting associated with a male character that ends up being, at least in the part way through the second issue into the third issue, they end up working together. And teaming up, so I'm assuming they're gonna be a team together in the long run. But he's got his own interesting powers and stuff, and they're a fun, fun team up when they they are dealing with the demons. They have uh, no fear. They have fun doing their job, and they just kind of let each other take on the characters themselves and see what they can do do with it. Like when they in the third one, they find out there's a bunch of kids being kept in a nunnery and we find out that all the nuns in the nunnery are demons and so he sends her in to deal with it to see how how she she'll end up uh getting in and infiltrating the bad people along the way but yeah we find a little pickpocket that's in the nunnery that she was mainly wanting to save. She wasn't sure about the rest of the kids and a lot of the other kids end up being in trances and stuff. So she thinks they're already possessed, but we do find out that the pickpocket is working for the demons a little bit, but she does her little tricks and things to get things to work out. But this is a really fun series. I'm glad I picked it up. I would have never even thought about it if it wasn't for Troy Dungara doing a cover I would probably would have never crossed my table but yeah I'm really happy it did I don't I haven't seen the number four or anything in any catalogs which kind of is a bummer because they leave you hanging at a point that yeah it feels like it's complete yet this team up of two characters it just feels like it's going to go on to a new series or something like that so and I don't see nothing in like my comic shop showing anything beyond number three either so <clears throat> but yeah 
I will definitely follow wherever this goes. Keen spots. Been putting all kinds of fun new stuff out. So. Yeah, it's the, there's always a big debate between the variant covers, you know, a faction of people that, um, you know, don't like them and for, you know, obvious reasons and, um, you know, whether they're a, you know, business owner, you know, retailer, things like that, and just dealing with all these multiple covers and pre-orders and trying to keep everything organized. It's understandable, but then you have the other side of it where, you know, somebody that you like does a variant cover, gets you to try out a series that um, maybe you never would have stumbled upon. And, you know, that's happened with Troy a couple of times with, you know, seeing Art and Franco covers that led to Troy Dungara. Now you're a fan of Troy Dungara. You see a cover that led you to this series. I usually have a thing that if I see a Jenny Frizen cover on a brand new number one that I normally wouldn't ever even buy, like, well, it's a really cool cover. I'm going to buy it at least for that. It's worth it for, you know, the three or $4 for the cover art. I'm like, yeah, I'll open it up and read it and, you know, discover a new series at the same time. So so yeah, those variant covers definitely do um, serve an awesome purpose to get people excited and collect art and discover new stories that way too. Yeah, and if it wasn't for high school horrors and stuff, mm -hmm. I probably wouldn't have even got into Keen Spot Entertainment and then Kid Slapshot and then Rob Potsy Potcheck. I mean, I got hooked up through him through those, and yeah, it's they introduced me to a lot of interesting characters. Cool, cool, cool. All right, let's see if there's some uh, other interesting characters in Katie's next topic here. What you got for us? Okay, I have Thor by Walt Simonson, but not from Marvel. This is uh, at, from IDW. I have Ragnarok, The Breaking of Helheim, number two and three. Um, and it is by Walt Simonson. Uh, the colors are by Laura Martin. Letters are John Workman. And the editor is Scott Dunbeer. Uh, Louise is not on this book. So these issues were given to me by Anthony from a friend. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, the Simonsons are one of my all-time favorite creative teams throughout comics. I would love to intern for them. Uh, you know, I'll even wash some dishes in exchange for being able to learn from their creative process. Um, so obviously Marvel does not own the concept of Thor overall. They own their version of it, but not the Norse god from the different myths and legends that has now been uh, revitalized through several different uh, modern day religious traditions. So uh, Walt Simonson is doing his own interpretation on Thor post Ragnarok. Um, so all the gods have died and it's kind of this like apocalyptic wasteland and Thor, Thor interestingly does not have a lower jaw. <laughs> um, and people were asking him about it. He's like, oh, I just kind of drew him that way. <laughs> uh, anyway, I was super excited to try out this book because I've read plenty of the Marvel Thor by Walt Simonson. Love it, grab those trades if you haven't. So I was excited to see what he does where, uh, you know, it's a little more like, PG-13, even verging into R in some places, just like, a, how does somebody who knows one version of the character very well do their own version? And I loved this book. I definitely want to get the trades. Uh, there's been several runs of this series. Um, and anyway, Thor is purposely getting himself captured in Helheim because he's looking for uh, Hell who is in this case, the daughter of Loki. Um, so he's getting himself purposely captured. Madness ensues. Uh, the bad guy in this series name is Freyr. Um, and Freyr, it has a bunch of slaves. Uh, we'll, we'll call them what they are. Mining in the soul iron mines for him uh, and for his nefarious purposes. So Thor gets himself captured and uh he gets sent to the mines and it people end up realizing that he is thor the god of thunder and a lot of the people are very excited about that he's like they're like oh he's you know he's gonna rescue us right but one of the uh bad dwarfs they call them the black dwarves in here um and he he runs and snitches to Freyr that it's actually Thor the god of thunder and it ends on a cliffhanger where Freyr is going to destroy the mines and all the slaves and prisoners within that. Um, we do have some awesome uh, letters pages here in the back, as well as some nice process pages. Um, 
And then I'll go ahead and review issue three right away. Basically, issue three is, you know, it, it picks right up with them in the mines, and the mines are being flooded with lava. And then Thor says, everybody get behind me. And he grabs his hammer and crack a boom and, you know, causes a thunderstorm inside, which puts out the fire. Uh, very cool stuff. And eventually sees that Freyr is possessed by a demon. And we have a little interlude going on with some of the other figures from North mythology. Uh, that, that seems like something that is maybe explored larger in the series. We have Thor fighting grandmother Ellie, who is the personification of death um, and freeing the prisoners. And the prisoners you know, are asking for their wives back because people are like, well, why didn't you just leave? And they're like, well, Freyr's holding our wives hostage. And we see there's a bit of a heel turn with that, with uh, some of the characters who were uh, who were acting as those wives and telling them, oh yeah, they're alive, they're still here. We get to see something about that. And then anyway, uh, now free from Freyr and having set free the captive, Thor is on his road deeper into Helheim on his demon goat, accompanied by a talking squirrel uh, looking for hell. And they're like, oh, be careful on the road. Watch out for the worm. And Thor's like, the worm? The worm. It turns out the road is actually made of the dragon, uh, Nidhogyr. Uh, and that's the end of issue number three. Again, with some cool back matter. Uh, I loved it. I definitely want to get more of this series. Uh, Walt Simonson shines writing this character. And I like getting to see him do something different than the Marvel Thor, a little, a little more true to the mythology, a little bit darker, a little scarier, but uh, still excellently done. And then let's just shout out this creative team one more time because they knocked it out of the park uh, with their beautiful artwork. So the story and art is by Walter Simonson, colors are by Laura Martin, letters are John Workman, and the editor is Scott Dunbar. Uh, yeah, right away you can pick up this book and tell that Walt Simonson is doing the art on this. It looks fantastic. Uh, love the details on it. Um, I got this book as a gift, but I would totally have paid $5 for this book. It is worth it. Absolutely. Um, and I look forward to reading more. Anyway, that is Ragnarok, The Breaking of Helheim from IDW Comics. Check it out at your local product bookshop. Cool, cool. Yeah, and it's always entertaining to see, uh, you know, like how like a dog would react to a squirrel is a uh, kind of similar <laughs> thing to when a squirrel is mentioned and Kirby, you know, perks up and, he, you know, a talking squirrel yeah. is like, okay, what's going on here? <laughs> there, there's a meat. There's yes. a meat here yeah, and it's, it's interesting. <laughs> uh, it turns out Thor's goat is called Lady and she is definitely a carnivore. So she's eating like all the orcs and uh, <laughs> haunted skeletons that are, are coming out trying to hassle her. And yeah, the a talking squirrel that is very smart and a little bit foul mouth. Pretty funny. <laughs> Good stuff. And like, is that yeah. squirrel, like there is one, uh, is it like Rotata something? Like, is that something that's related oh. or is it something different? Is that... Good question. Let me check. Because in the War of the Realms for Marvel, they had some, I think it was some big, like, trying to think if that was a big squirrel or something, but it was like Rotat something, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I do remember what you're talking about. I don't know the name of of this squirrel, but it, it could yeah. be. Absolutely. Yeah, I was wondering if that was will, part of, uh, of the initial Norse mythology or something, mm -hmm. or just a coincidence, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure, but that would be really cool how they uh, did that. Cool, cool, cool. All right, All right. well, Kirk, Kirby, uh, we're going to cut over to you here. And uh, we got one more title in our weekly reviews, so you can uh, hit it home what you got here. All right. Well, I picked up, well, didn't pick up, I had Savage Dragon versus Savage Megaton Man one shot. Uh, story art and covers by Eric Larson and Don Simpson. When their universes cross over, Simpson's muscle bound superhero spoof Megaton Man or Megaton Man meets Larson's dragon. And of course, they must fight. Also includes pinups by Simpson and Larson. Uh, this is a ton of fun. This <laughs> is probably, I don't know. If they played with the multiverse much in the 90s, but this is 
a nice little spoof on the whole multiverse thing. You had the Savage Dragon world, which we're used to in the standard comics, and then the Megaton. Man, world gets crossed over <laughs> with it, so you get those two different animation plays in here, which was wonderful. And we got in Megaton, well, Megaton, man's world, these characters are kind of like the good guys that keep everything in check, and they're watching a screen showing something from the future or from another world where they see the Savage Dragon's big finned head on the screen, and he's being attacked by a bunch of other characters, but they think he's the one attacking them because he's doing all the damage and stuff so they're like oh he's a bad cop they do notice that he's a police officer <clears throat> but they think all these characters are the good guys so but instead they're hunting down savage dragon to make him pay back for what he's done to them in the past and it's just they're they're called I and mean, this always with savage dragon every time i read it there's so much parody stuff but in this one the game that's after mm -hmm. the savage dragon is called the next men and i x e d instead of the next men and it's mm -hmm. like fun little plays on that but yeah you see they they have a portal that can teleport them to different realms this thing here and they put megaton man on first he gets transported to the Savage Dragon's world, and they, the teleporter, of course, has problems, so they can't follow him through space and catch up to him right away. So he sees what's going on, and he attacks the Savage Dragon because he sees the other characters running away and thinks that the dragon's running after them to cause more problems. So Megaton Man jumps in. And they get into a nice big scrap, but soon they realize they're both on the same side and they end up working things out, but they do battle for a while until they figure that out. And it's fun watching them do battle. <laughs> and then of course, the rest of the gang that ran off comes back with their secret weapon, which is a oh. giant ogre-like type beast. And it's like, six times bigger than Savage Dragon and Megaton Man. <laughs> it's just so they get to deal with that once that he's called Me Am Slag Heap. <laughs> mm. And so yeah, it's it was just a another book full of parody type hilarity. And just I love these characters. I love I have I have another one that'll be in probably next week or the week after episode another crossover with the savage dragon but but yeah it's just i can read these all day long so keep giving me the parody comics and it's by image of course so check forget, it out i forget what issue numbers but have you read the madman crossover in Sa savage dragon at all hmm. i believe i have it i don't remember if i read it or not yet the issues are probably just in the order there, so I could always just throw those numbers at you as a reminder, but that's all I've really read of Savage Dragon is uh, just those couple issues, but yeah, if you're looking yeah. for crossover stuff. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I like the crossover one shots. They're fun. <laughs> all right. Well, that is going to do it for the weekly reviews as well as the show. That was a lot of good stuff for you. Once again, as a reminder, we will have future club discussions in the upcoming episodes. Uh, as long as everyone is available, we should be having a show next week. Uh, but uh, two Saturdays from now is C2E2 weekend. So that is going to be, uh, you know, we'll be off for that one. And I'll be running down to C2E2 and uh, meeting a former guest on this show, Matt Fife, for the first time. Uh, so that'll be pretty fun and exciting. But uh, yeah, so we should have at least another show here in March uh, before just a one little week break. 
Um, some plugs here on how to find us on the internet if this happens to be your first episode. We have a website, crimsoncowl.com. On there, we have some free exclusive web comics from the uh, co creator of this very podcast and Crimson Cowl Media brand alongside his son. They have a comic called Tales from the North. It's a free ongoing anthology series that's created by David Gloyd II. It is a dark fantasy comic based on the setting of his RPG campaigns. Chapters one and two are available now as well as a winter holiday special so you can only read those on crimsoncowl.com if you want to email us if you have a questions or comments if you have any uh, future letters page questions of things that we could uh, answer here on the show for a fun segment you can email us crimsoncowlcomicclub at yahoo.com please check out the youtube channel and like and subscribe on there uh, Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube. Uh, coming soon because it's now officially recorded. Uh, just has to throw in a little uh, little bit of editing, but we are going to be launching our Hellboy Book Club series. We'll be diving through all of the uh, main story arcs of the Hellboy uh, uh, stories and everybody that's here in the club. You know, not everybody can make it every time, but uh, everybody's welcome to join. And we have our first episode covering the uh, Seed of Destruction story, and uh, that all went well. So we will uh, launch in that as a YouTube only mm-hmm. series. So that is a great uh, uh, incentive to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Crimson Cowl Comic Club on YouTube. Check us out on Instagram. The Crimson Cowl, all one word. Subscribe to us on iTunes to get the audio version. At the time of this recording, we are getting, uh, actually by the time this is released, we should be uh, all caught up on all of the back issues of the last couple of weeks of the last month uh, where we had some uh, uh, audio problems with the iTunes uh, submissions and things like that. But all that stuff is up and rolling. The YouTube episodes came out normally. So uh, all of that is back in order. Uh, Kirby has a spinoff podcast called Under the Cowl of MS. Would you like to give us a brief description of what it is and what's coming up in this uh you know, for under the color of MS? Yeah, comic books, multiple sclerosis, other entertainment, whatever I feel like talking about. I was going to try and do seven days a week with the audio, but I'm slacking on my weekends. <laughs> so uh, we'll see what happens in the future. But we did put out a couple videos, including a new segment of comics from a land down under. And uh, <laughs> we uh, have maybe one or two other interesting new segments popping up hopefully soon so keep an eye out on the youtube having seen the episode you're not talking about australia so no (laughs) (laughs) a little bit warmer than there (laughs) (laughs) to say the least all right uh so yes check out under the color of ms or wherever you get your uh, podcast across all the social medias as well as youtube subscribe to that we are going to have some upcoming guests here on the show. I think we're going to let March go by and uh, all the other craziness that's happening. Uh, but Desmond Reed is going to be a future guest on this podcast. And what will be exciting is that when he comes on, he gets to talk about the success of the Kickstarter that helped Woo-hoo. publish for the Cola Pop Creamies that I was promoting. And uh, so that Kickstarter has ended and they got funded just under the wire. So that's pretty exciting. So uh, we'll probably uh, have them on and talk about uh how to reach that book and follow those characters and all that fun stuff um steve urena who is the uh creator of uh many comics including slow pokes that we talked about slow pokes 2 in last week's episode in which i had a uh, brutal cameo in uh, but steve uh dug that and spread the word and he said he would be uh something along the lines of he would be delighted to be on a future episode Aww when he's got another Kickstarter project to promote something that probably me or Kirby are probably going to appear in somewhere, I'm sure. But, um, but yep. So Steve is all on board for that as well. And then uh, hopefully this will be maybe the final, maybe the penultimate tease of a secret YouTube project that I have in the works. So stay tuned to this feed and you're not, if you follow us and listen to us, you're not going to miss that announcement. Um and uh, I'm Anthony Latch, and I have a Hobby Artist Facebook and Instagram account. That's Anthony L A A 
T-S-C-H, if you want to follow some of that stuff. And then my former podcast, uh, which was a weekly podcast called The AB Conversation, has just released a brand new special after two and a half years. We cover movies, television, comic books, and food. The most important segment from our fans is food. Uh, Kirby was the, uh, or I should say listener Kirby, uh, was a uh, many-time uh, contributor to the food segment, including, was it a bacon and cheese cricket or something like that? Yeah, and, some type of flavored crickets. <laughs> yeah, it was it was a very interesting episode and made for some great audio. But the AB <laughs> conversation is back with a brand new special after two and a half years, so you can find out what uh, what we've been missing over there. And I'll maybe throw out a tease that uh, maybe there's another special episode in the in the behind the scenes works as well. So follow the AB conversation podcast as well. Um, that one is. Uh, I guess I'll say mature listeners. Uh, this one kind of have it listed as mature in case, you know, some random flesh eating cheerleader book gets, you know, shown or something <laughs> like that. But uh, yeah, some of the dialogue that happens in AB conversation uh, could get a little blue from time to time. So just an FYI. Uh, but yep, yeah, that is going to do it. That's a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of different podcasts, a lot of places you can follow us. We appreciate the likes and follows, the shares and the retweets and the, all of that fun stuff. So Check out Crimson Cowell Comic Club wherever you get your stuff. That's going to do it for this episode. This whole time, I've been sweaty like I just ate some dodgy shrimp. I've been savagely beating up Hydro with Silver Sable. And I'm going to hell with Thor. To be continued.